Put your hands together for Joshua Cassidy. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. Pastor Karen, give me the opportunity to share from my heart the word of the Lord. Come on, are you excited? Come on, Jesus. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Bless you guys. Come on. This word is going to change your life. If I have one shot to preach here, I'm going to say this message. This revelation Jesus gave me changes the way I pray, changes the way I read the Bible. And if you get it into your heart and let it seep down into your spirit, it will change your life forever. It will change your life forever. Come on. 1 John 3.1 is the text. 1 John 3.1, New Living Translation. You can't be a father unless you know how to be a son. You can't be a mother unless you know how to be a daughter. 1 John 3, 1. See how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children. And that is what we are. Thank you, Jesus, that you move in power. Speak through me tonight. We love you. Holy Ghost, have your way. We love you, Jesus. Take charge right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. So I was a cop for five years. In the middle of that, I got saved. At the end of five years, the Lord told me to go to Bible school for full time to be a pastor. I started working at a grocery store. And the first week, which was a hard transition, the first week being there, the pastor spoke a word about how God's your father. I mean, hey, you, you grow up learning these things and hear these things. It's one thing to hear something, but it's one thing to know something. God's our Father, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible. But to actually know it with all of your being is different than just hearing something. So the altar call came. I came up to receive impartation, and I was just kind of thinking about my earthly dad. You know, he worked three jobs. He was always gone, and there were some opportunities that we missed. I love my dad. I forgive my dad, of course. But there were some things you wish would be better, some things that you wish that could happen. And as I'm sitting there and praying, I hear God so distinctly say, you know, son, I was at every football game you was ever played. When you were caught for five years, I protected you every day. You had more than a bulletproof vest on. You had me. Even when you was far away from me, my arms were always open, ready, waiting for you to come back home. You are made in his image. In his image. A couple weeks ago, I was at the gym, and I was looking at the monitor. I have it I always off. I listen to my AirPods. And I was thinking about that. I am made in his image. And I started thinking, oh, we must have some characteristics of ourself. And as I'm looking at my reflection in the mirror, it turned into, I was looking at my dad. And he was staring at me. And he was just saying, I love you, son. I'm proud of you. You're amazing. I dance over you. I'm, I get excited over you. That's what he was saying to me. And that excitement downloaded to me. When my wife told me that she was pregnant with my son, all I could think about for days was, I'm going to be a dad. I'm going to be a dad. I'm going to be a dad. At the grocery store, ma'am, I'm going to be a dad. I don't care. Just don't squish my bread. Uh, yes, ma'am. Boop, boop. Man, what the? I was telling everybody, I'm going to be a dad. One morning, I was making Cocoa Puffs in the kitchen or something. Just like numb with love, like, dude, I'm going to be a dad. God speaks to me and says, that's how excited I get when a new believer comes into my family. I get to be a dad. He's your father. He loves you. He cherishes you. He roots for you. He believes in you. He is for you, not against you. He has his name. He has your name written on his hand. So when he worships, he looks at you and says, I am proud of you. You are a daughter of the most high king. You are a son. That's your dad. He's not angry at you. He dances for you. Believe upon him. You can have this too. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved and you will be a part of his family. His family. His family. In Jesus' name, someone say glory to God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. Put your hands together for David Kimura. 
Hey, turn with me in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. You guys ready? We're so excited. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Thank you, Pastor Daniel, for this opportunity. Awesome. Seven, almost seven years ago to the date, my, wife, my amazing wife made me a father. What an amazing day. June 25th, 2014 was the first when my son was born almost seven years ago. Crazy. Okay, Deuteronomy, let's go to the scripture. Oh, ver, uh, chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Everybody say children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the droplet doorsteps of your house and your gates. Lord God, we thank you for what you're going to do tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we're going to go. The thing about this scripture is it tells us to teach our kids. The thing about it is we can't have godly kids without godly fathers. So as we allow godly kids to be raised up, we have to know that we have to be the best model of godly fathers in their lives. And, the, and, and as we look at Deuteronomy, we see Moses, who is one of the forefathers of Christianity, of who, what God did in the earth, declare over the Israelites what it means to start being a father. It's just one way. Because fatherness in this generation, in this country, is so prevalent. It makes me sad to think of how many kids don't know what fatherhood is. I'm just going to give you a little bit of stats. You guys ready? And I took this from the National Center of Fathering. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 90% of runaway children come from fatherless home. 71% of dropouts from high school come from fatherless home. 85% of all youth in prison come from fatherless homes. Let me encourage you tonight that we need more fathers. Whether it be biological, whether it be spiritual, we need the men of this house, the men of the church, the men of this community to stand up and define what fathers, Christian godly fathers are. This is the crazy thing is we, if we look at culture, we look at society, we, we turn on the TV, they sometimes mock what fatherhood is. It's a joke. But realistically, I don't take it as a joke. And neither should you. There's three ways that we can be better godly fathers based upon this scripture. Number one, we must show our children how to love Jesus. See, we are Jesus' hands, feet, mouths, heart, brains on this earth. If we don't allow God to be in us to show him who, how, how we love him, our kids will never understand how to love him just the same. So I want to encourage you guys to to show Jesus, show our kids how to love Jesus. Like it says in verse 5, you shall love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. See, God wants us to love him with everything and show the people around us including our kids. That's why I want to encourage you to bring your kids to early morning prayer. Bring your kids to church to be involved in a life group or a team because if you don't, nobody else will. But yet you want the church to save your kid when your kid goes, "Mm, okay, here we go. Next thing is we need to model slash teach them how to be like Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, out of the Amplified Version, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. 
See, if you don't imitate who God is in your household, then don't expect for your kids to imitate God in the community. See, God wants to do something in you so he can do something through you. And he, God wants to do something in your kids to do something through them. But if they don't know what Jesus looks like, how Jesus acts, who Jesus is, that will never happen. So we look and we say, okay, son, this is what it is to be like Jesus. Love. Just as the Christ loved the church. And the last thing is this. As we show them, as we model, we release. I want to encourage you guys tonight to release your children. As you've taught them godly things, as you model what it is to be godly as, as a father, we need to release them because the greatest principle that God gave us well, it's in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. It says, there go, for, they, there, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. See, the only way that happens is if God is in them. That starts with us. That starts with you. That starts with me. We need more godly fathers today than we've ever needed them before. In closing, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge every dad, every stepdad, every foster dad, every spiritual dad to remember one thing or things. The way we live our lives, the way we lead our homes will affect our children, our marriage, and the generations to come. So do this one thing. This is where I said the one thing. I got my notes confused. Do this one thing. Be the best godly father you can be. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for Pastor Vince Vinson. Hey, how y'all doing tonight? All right. I want to thank Pastor Daniel for giving me this opportunity to share this word with you. Um, can you open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8? One of the most difficult chapters in the Bible. It's a good thing I won't, I only have a few minutes. I won't be covering the whole chapter. <laughs> Just a few scriptures. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to be reading from verses 12 through 17. And it says, therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If we indeed, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. God, we ask that you add a blessing to the reading of your holy word. You know, when I was growing up, it was a kind of confusing time for me in my life because my mother was married four times. Okay, that's a bunch of, Dads, okay, and a lot of people complain about a lack of dads. Well, I had a plethora of dads, okay, so, and I absolutely identified with none of my dads. My, my, my birth dad never lived more than 15 miles away from me, but I never saw him unless I initiated contact, and every time I did, I ended up in a bar somewhere. And, um, you know, him laughing and, and, and talking to other people and him being drunk. I never talked to, a, to my dad, my birth dad, sober. So you understand that I have a, a, a weird problem of attaching to people, especially people in authority over me. So I had a real bad authority problem. My, my second dad, his name was George. And George was very gorgeous, a handsome man, but he was an auto mechanic. Yeah, gorgeous George. He was, he was, he was pretty. 
you know. And then my, my, my mother's third husband was named Slim, okay. And along came Slim, and I never really met my mother's fourth husband. Okay, that happened way after I was an adult, way after I was saved. But I want you to know that, that God, get, God saved me. And when he saved me, he helped me with my father image and announced himself that he was my father. <laughs> oh, you're talking about, you know, group therapy classes, all the things I went through growing up, you know, in high school. You know, I didn't never know I was in group therapy. And then about three years after I graduated, I kind of realized that, oh, they had me in group therapy. You know, <laughs> so I was meeting all these other kids, you know, that they had problems, you know. And my main problem was, you know, I didn't know how to identify with who I was, you know. But God solved all that when I got saved. And it was an amazing thing that God introduces himself to us as our true father. If we will receive adoption, he doesn't force it on us. He said, you have to receive me as your father. And tonight, God wants you to receive him um, in in Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. Then the heir of God through Christ. We get everything that Christ got. We get all the attributes of God. All the power of God and the name of God to use as the Holy Spirit leads us. He put the Holy Spirit in our hearts so that we could be guided. The, the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And now I'm getting direction from heaven from a place I've never gotten direction before. And I was looking for a father. Tell me how to be a man. Tell me how to be a father. God had to teach me. God had to show me. And he was the perfect father, but I had this communication gap because I had this confused identity problem with fathers because I had, over my lifetime, four of them. Okay, so God had to work through all that, and he's just now, through, through godly examples of men in this church like Pastor Daniel and his family, Pastor Kirsten and his family, I'm starting to learn how to be a father. And I'm, I'm 62 years old. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm trying to get a handle on it. But I'm, I'm trying to relate to my kids to tell them that you have a father. Even if all the stuff I messed up, all the stuff I, I jacked up, I will be, it's because I, jacked up, I was jacked up, not because you were jacked up. But you can have the same father that I have, a perfect father who doesn't make mistakes, who will teach you how to do all things, who will show you the way, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. So, you know, I was under a lot of pressure to be a father. And it's, it's great that you can introduce your kids to somebody who could be the father that they really needed. To be the father that they can call upon day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week when they go off to college, when they have to go off to work, when they go off to school. You have to teach your kids who their father is, the one that will never leave them nor forsake them. You know, me, one day I'm going to die and croak and I'm going to go away from them. And they won't be able to call me at midnight. But you can call God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I want to leave you with this one little word in the last little seconds that I have. In um, Psalms chapter 37, verses 23 through 26, it says, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord opposed him with his free hand. I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful, lends, and his descendants are blessed. You're blessed in Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Put your hands together for Minister Barry Haggerty. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. While you're turning there, I want to thank Pastor Daniel for the opportunity and what an honor it is to stand before you with these other great men of God 
on this Father's Day. I also want to thank Zach, Hope, Bo, Erica, Maylee, John, my, daughter, my daughter-in-law, Mandy, and my three granddaughters, Allie, Ella, and Brave, for giving me the honor to be dad and papa and poppy and granddad. Uh, so Father's Day is a great day, and I'm so glad that you're here tonight. Luke chapter 15, verse 20 says, So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Tonight, in my brief time, I want to share with you the father who ran. The father who ran. On this Father's Day tonight, I want to encourage all of us that we have a great father who loves us, who watches over us, who is aware of us, and who runs to us. Number one, he's a great father. Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6 says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families, and he leads forth the prisoners with singing. Uh, Like my brother from another mother, I had four fathers. Uh, I didn't have a great father when I needed one. My real father left when I was five years old. My next stepfather died three months after he married my mom. The third stepfather was an alcoholic unbeknownst to us. In two years, I suffered under abuse, physical abuse. And by the time I got my fourth stepfather, I was done with dads. And Father's Day was not a great day for me until I became a father. On the day that I became a father, I realized, there is something about being a dad and I'm so thankful and then I got an encounter with our heavenly father and when I had an encounter a face to face encounter in a vision with the heavenly, my heavenly father I realized how great a father he is he is our heavenly father there is nobody like him he is altogether lovely he is wonderful he is our counselor he is our protector he is our provider and he is our Abba father so number one we have a great father And he loves, number two, he loves us, Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. If my wife was here, she'd say, slow down. So hold on. Psalm chapter 5, verse 12 says, you surround them with your shield of love. Not only is he a great father, but he loves us. He loves us unconditionally. Do you realize tonight there is nothing you can do that will cause your heavenly father to love you any more than he already does? And there's not anything you can do that will cause him to love you any less than he already does. He is love. And because he is love, he loves you and I unconditionally. And because he loves us, Point number three, he watches over us. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may support those whose hearts is completely his. In this parable in Luke chapter 15 that Jesus told, the father was watching for his son. I mean, he had to be when you look at the very intentional words that Holy Spirit had Luke record in verse 20. While he, the son, was still a long way off, his father saw him. If you can let, give me just a second, I'll, I'll set it this way because this is how the Lord made me to think. I think the day that the prodigal son walked off and his father watched him walk down the road, I think he turned to his servants and said, move my desk, move my phone, move my computer, my fax machine, the internet, move it all out on the front porch and I'm going to conduct business on the front porch because the same road that he walked down walking away is the same road that I know he's going to turn around and walk back. And I'm not going to be caught by surprise. I'm going to be watching. And that's what Jesus was saying, that this father was watching for his son to return. No matter where we go, church, our father is watching. He knows the path that we choose if we choose to set on our own. And he knows the path that will lead us back home. And it is on that path that his eyes are fixed. And he is watching for his children. So he not only is a great father who loves loves us and who watches, but he is a father who is aware. He is aware of us. Matthew chapter 10 verse 30 says, but even the hairs on your head are all numbered or even the hairs that are supposed to be there are all numbered. (laughs) Love you, brother. I'm going out of order from the text because the father ran first and then declared things over his son, but I'm saving the running part for my last point. This was his son. This was his child. And he was home to the delight and the joy of the father. The father may have been disappointed in the choices his son had made, but he was never, he was never disappointed in his son. Look at the words the father says about his son. Verse 22 of chapter 15. But the father said to his servants, quick, quick. 
Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Notice what it doesn't say. He doesn't say to his son, I wish you'd been more like your brother. I wish you'd have listened to me. What a disappointment you turned out to be. He doesn't say those things. And you know what? Your heavenly father is never, ever disappointed with you and I as his children. He loves us. He doesn't wish we were somebody else because we were fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. He's a great father. He loves you and I. He watches over you and I. He is very aware of you and I. And I want to tell you tonight, he runs. He runs. I can't really paint a better picture of the heart of Father God than Jesus did here in Luke chapter 15. God, who is the creator, God, who is the supreme power of the universe, God, who is omniscient, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent, present everywhere at once, the one who spoke everything into existence, the one who holds it all in the palm of his hand, the one who, when he says it's over, it's over, he ran to you and I when we took that first step, and that's the key. Taking the first step is our part, because that's what it says in the beginning of verse 20. It says, He got up and he went to his father. And that's all it took was getting up and going to his father. I want to challenge you and encourage you tonight, wherever you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you've been, no matter what mistakes you might have made, no matter what hand life may have dealt you, if you will get up from where you are and you will turn your face towards your father and you will head toward him, he will cover the distance in a millisecond to meet you right where you are. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for Pastor Kirsten Davis. Hey, right on. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. Who has a boy in their house? Anybody have a young man in their house? Someone 13 to 25. You got one of those in your house? Who's got more than one of those in your house? What, a, what an amazing phenomenon to have sons in your house. Those of you that have sons in your house, you are keenly aware that That as they become young men, new things start showing up. New things are happening in their life. There's new smells. For some reason, we want to celebrate noises that come out of their body and get get an alert every time one of them goes off. And celebrate more when they don't smell so pleasant. Who's got a young man in their house that needs a better definition of what a shower is? That it's more than just wet hair. Anybody got a young man in their house that needs to know what deodorant is and that it needs to be used on a frequent basis? And sometimes it needs to be reapplied after a few hours. What a phenomenon to have young men in, their, in the house. It's amazing. Noises that come, battles in your house. I want to point out a few things about having a young man in your house. I want you to notice they never pretend to be losers. They never pretend to be conquered that someone else beat them. It's because they were made to win. They were made for first place. They, were nev- they never pretend to get second place. They always pretend to get the trophy. They never pretend to honor someone else. They worked harder than me and they got the trophy. You'll never find them doing that. Young men in your house, I have three. I thank God for them. We're walking through new days of feelings in my house. It's quite an interesting phenomenon that starts happening. Paul writes to Titus in chapter 2, the book of Titus, chapter 2. He singles out young men among all the people Titus is ministering to, specifically targets young men because young men need to be specifically targeted in your house in this church in your life group in your ministry young men need your attention Paul singles them out wants Titus to notice them because young men need something very specific take a look at Titus chapter 2 verse 6 encourage the young men to be self-controlled In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show. Everybody say show. Show integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that cannot be condemned 
so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Skip to verse 11. For the grace of God that, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Young men need models. They desperately need dad in their life. In this day and age, I can't tell you, as working with children for 20 plus years in this church, young men and boys desperately need models in their life. There is an assignment to destroy their life and make them confused and make them apologize for the way God's created them as young men. Men, please hear me. You are created by the master creator full of wisdom. Everything made about you, your ability to separate feelings in making decisions, your, your desire to protect, you are created by God and there is no reason to ever apologize. You are created to lose your mind if someone threatens your family. If someone breaks into my house, I am going to release everything in me to protect my family. And I'll never apologize for that. We live in a world that wants boys and young men to forget that. They desperately need models and not just dads in their life. They desperately need the uncle factor in their life. The most important person, the most important person in these three young men's lives right here is me. What I say over them, what I pronounce over them, what I declare over them, what I protect them from. I'm the gatekeeper of the families that they're going to produce. It's Father's Day, and I'm thinking about the fathers sitting right here and what they're going to be. And I work hard, and I get up, and I pray every day. But there's someone in, my, in their life that they will work harder for than me. I'm going to die and, and give everything I got to make sure they have what they need but there's someone in their life that they'll serve greater than me. It's uncle. All the dads and men in this room, you have a power over my sons that I don't have, and they desperately need you in their life. I am desperately needed in your son's life to walk up to them and say, you're a fine young man. They're not going to hear that at school. They're going to hear confusing things at school. They're going to watch Disney shows that, that blur the lines of of masculinity, manhood, and make them feel like they have to apologize for being a man. Whoa, I only got a little bit left, sorry. So hear me today. Every man in this room, you have power. When you pronounce over one of these boys around here, you're a fine young man. You can be everything that God meant for you to be. You can be a great dad, even if they don't have a great background. You can pronounce something in their life that changes their destiny forever. The greatest heroes in my life were men at my church that I, when I was a boy, I can see them right now, standing with their arms lifted, weeping in the presence of the Lord. They never said anything to me, but I saw them, and they imprinted in my mind something I desperately needed, and they had power in my life. God used them in my life. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior, and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.